Good Monday morning. I'm Dan Podgerich of DK Pittsburgh Sports, and this is Daily Shot of Pirates. It comes your way right nearly every weekday if you're into football and or hockey. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Penguins that I hope you can check out. But this program is about Pirates 7, Cardinals 5, and avoiding a second consecutive 100-loss season for a few hours anyway. If they could still do it. Tonight against those same Cardinals, albeit at PNC Park, as well as tomorrow and the season finale Wednesday afternoon at the same place. And they probably will. Among the contributors to this particular victory, Ben Gamble hit a three-run homer. Brian Reynolds homered, had a couple of hits. Ji Juan Bay, who's now Hitting 308 and should have been here a lot longer than he's been here. Had a couple of hits. Ronzi Contreras didn't have the greatest start, but the bullpen really picked him up with six innings of one run relief, including David Bednar with the save, something he can carry into the offseason after what's been a pretty rough injury filled second half for him. And did I mention? that Gamble had a three-run homer. Oh, yes, I did do that. That's his ninth homer. Nothing to get excited about. He's batting two thirty two. Definitely not anything to get excited about. He doesn't have more modern numbers that are any more worth getting excited about than that. He pretty much is what he is at this stage of his career. And at the same time, he's also one of those guys that you look at that you can't help but look at and say, you know what, if I'm building a bench next year, I sure wouldn't mind having Gamble on it because you know he can play uh, both of the corner outfield positions. You know he's going to play them, how shall we put this, without fear. And I know, and I'm going to share with you today, that he means a lot to a good bunch of guys in that clubhouse. Now, go right ahead and roll your eyes, leadership this, leadership that. They could lose 100 with him. They could lose 100 without him. I get all that. I also get that as the team gets younger, and it will, it will still get younger because you're going to see, oh, I don't know, at whatever point arbitration allows, Andy Rodriguez and Henry Davis and Nick Gonzalez and kids like that work their way into this fold, as well as other guys who have been around a little bit and we've kind of gotten used to them and maybe don't think of them as prospects anymore, like the Cal Mitchells, Tucapito, Marcano, and so forth, Diego Castillo. These individuals, a lot of them, really gravitate toward Gamble. Gamble is exactly as raw and baseball passionate as you would imagine him to be, just based on watching his, I don't want to say antics, but occasionally it feels like antics, the way he's just throwing himself at the baseball. And I can promise that you'll have a very hard time being a young player around Gamble who doesn't approach the game the same way. This portion of Daily Shot of Pirates is brought to you by our friends at North Shore Tavern that's directly across Federal Street from PNC Park. It's home of Steak on a Stone, an eating experience, underscoring the word experience. The steak is brought to you partially cooked on an 800-degree stone, and you do the rest. It's a ton of fun, it's a great meal, and it's a baseball atmosphere like no other in Pittsburgh. North Shore Tavern, right across Federal Street from PNC Park. So the decision isn't more about whether or not Gamble is a guy who should be playing on a regular basis, he shouldn't be, or whether or not he'd be worth X value, because the bigger picture powerfully suggests that a team like the Pirates, even when things get good, if they get good, are never going to be able to spend a bunch on bench guys. If you'll recall in the 2013-15 to run, 
the bench was populated with, in a lot of cases, older guys who'd been very, very successful earlier in their careers, whether that was a Ramis Ramirez coming back, Justin Morneau, Marlon Bird. And they were acquired late in the regular season after the deadline or even after the uh, after the waiver deadline, back when that existed, it doesn't anymore. So you only had to pick up, you know, a couple months of their salary. So if you're looking at your bench and you're saying, okay, we need to populate first and foremost the everyday eight, and we need to make sure we're not blocking uh, a legit prospect from a spot in that everyday eight uh, if and once they've earned it. Well, Gamble would never do that. I mean, the moment you'd have, you know, another outfielder out there, in addition to Reynolds and Jack Sawinski, who also had a big hit yesterday, Gamble's just someone that you say, hey, Ben, you know, thanks for everything. Here's the bench. We need you on Sunday. Make sure you're ready to play Sunday. <laughs> Something like that. You know what I mean? But you need those guys. You need four of them. And to this same point, what you can't do is have a bunch of prospects on that bench. That looks wonderful on a Baseball America diagram, but it doesn't work at all in real life. Because what happens to those prospects when they're on the bench? Exactly. They don't play. And then they don't develop, and then you stunt them. It's really, really hard, although it's been done, for teams to designate someone as kind of a permanent bench guy, uh, multiple super utility guy, and maybe that's going to be the fate of someone like, say, Castillo, who can play a lot of different positions, who busts it to cover ground wherever it is that you put him out there, and he can hit just enough. Maybe. We'll see about that. But for the most part, if you're taking someone like, let's say, just to throw another name out there, Cal Mitchell, and saying, Cal, you know, we don't really see you as everyday eight type material in the long term, but you'd make a fine bench guy. And then you sit him on the bench and he never gets any better. All he's going to do is strike out. All he's going to do is strike out. That's why you still need people like this and you don't want them to cost very much. But when we come back, J1Q. Right, who says, DK, I'm one of your military subscribers to DK Pittsburgh Sports. I can't thank you enough for this. It's allowed me to feel like I'm back in Pittsburgh, even when I'm far away from home. Just to interrupt Stephen here for a second, at our website, which I sure hope you've checked out at this point, it's also an app that you can find for free at the App Store at Google Play. We have forever, for all eight years that we've existed, uh, given all of our subscriptions as gratitude from us for free to all active duty military from there. Our readers have put together their own program where they fund the veterans. So that's what Steven's referring to here. If you haven't checked out DK Pittsburgh sports yet, like seriously, like why not? Uh, Steven's goes on to say, we all hope that our players love the team and city as much as the fans do. But I realize that baseball is a business it's the player's livelihood, and they have a more pragmatic attitude toward it. With the futility of the past several years combined of the Pirates, with the weak financial commitment from the front office, are players now wanting to get themselves out of Pittsburgh as soon as they can? Are they asking their agents to work to get them traded? Are free agents never seem to stay? Is it all purely money, or are they tired of being part of a losing organization? The answer to your question, Stephen, is a plain and simple no. Uh, it's just not how they come up. It's not how they handle being here. And for the most part, the explanation for it is so much more academic than you'll probably believe in hearing from me. But 
baseball players exist every day to play baseball. Now, there are some, there really are, who will show up for work with all kinds of cerebral, big scope subject matters that interest them. And quite possibly among them is what everybody else in baseball is making, who's winning, who's committed, who's not. I've covered a few of those, but that's all it is. It's only a few. Overwhelmingly, baseball players are focused on the game that they're playing that night. And once that one's done, getting some sleep and waking up with a completely fresh approach to the next game they're going to play that day. That is their world. The Pirates are these players' world. Sure, they look across to the other dugout and see the Dodgers making $300 million in terms of their payroll. And you saw that from their reaction that they had out in L.A. with that sweep. They knew what they were doing. They knew the magnitude of it. But for anyone in the Pirates dugout to be looking across at the other one and thinking, man, I'd rather be part of that. Guess what has to happen first? Yeah, right. They've got to be good. So what we're really doing here, if we want to have a, a, a blunt and honest dialogue about this, is we've got to identify who we're talking about. And it's really Reynolds and a couple other guys. And in those cases, whether it's Reynolds or let's just throw in for the fun of it, you know, O'Neill Cruz, Mitch Keller, you could say Brian Hayes, but Key is kind of in his own category because he signed the nine-year contract and everything. These other guys are the Pirates' property for the next three, four, five years. They're not going anywhere. They're not going anywhere. And if they want to squawk, which I'm going to really emphasize here, I've never heard from any of them. But if they were going to squawk about how oh, I really hate being with a loser or whatever else here, they'd ultimately hurt themselves a lot because then they would develop that reputation and they don't want that within their own world. And I'm going to repeat that their world is the pirates, not the way that you and I think of them or the way that they get discussed on talk shows, but as their friends, as their teammates, as the ones that they're high-fiving after every drill, as the ones that they're talking about their lives and their family issues with. When Reynolds says, and he does this a lot, that he's passionate about staying with the pirates and staying in Pittsburgh, it kind of... To a cynic, it can make him sound like a loser. Like, really, man? I mean, you're a pretty good player. You know, you could go somewhere. You could do something. But his attachment, in large part, is to friends, to teammates, to people who've helped him along the way. That's just the way he is. By the way, you know who one of his, maybe his very best bud on the team is Gamble. And Reynolds was one of the guys that I was talking about in the opening segment who Miss someone like Gamble. Not that you keep Gamble for that reason, but it's just something else that you add to the list. These players don't talk about these things that we talk about. I say this a lot, but they don't talk about payrolls and contracts. They never, ever talk about Bob Nutting, not because they're afraid of him, just because he never comes up. He's not really in their world. I see him at the ballpark a lot, but it's not like he's traipsing through the clubhouse or anything. It's not like he's hanging around, you know, on the indoor batting cage or something. He might be in an outdoor batting cage session, but then so is everybody else, and he's not even going to get noticed. It's just not a thing. It's not a thing. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everyone listening to Daily Shot of Pirates. We'll have another one tomorrow. 